Uh, Flavia is a women's rights lawyer, a pioneer of the women's movement. She has worked consistently on issues of gender and law reforms. As co-founder of Majlis, a legal and cultural resource center, her primary engagement has been to provide quality legal services to women and children. She has played an important role in bringing women and child rights to the forefront within the legal system and in contextualizing issues of gender and identity. Significant among her many publications is her autobiographical book, My Story, Our Story, of Rebuilding Broken Lives, which has been translated into various languages. Majlis was started in 1991 as a response to a growing need for lawyers with a gender perspective who are dedicated to evolving innovative legal practices to defend women's rights. Flavia, we welcome you, please. Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here, and I'm very happy all of you are here so we can talk to each other, find out what we are doing, where we are lacking, and how do we go forward. Thank you, Rahul, for having this program and inviting us to be here uh, to be uh, talking at this event. Um, let me start. Actually, the, my uh, introduction note that I had sent had the second para, I think, due to time, uh, lack of time that got left out. Let me start with that, that what exactly uh, are the reason why we're here as Madhuris and what exactly we do. And from there, uh, I will go on to um, having these deliberations, uh, a talk which you can respond to. Uh, we uh, have a program called Rahat, which we started in 2011, much before Nirbhaya, much before Poxo. And it was a response to a situation that had arisen in our own vicinity. Till then, we were doing only matrimonial law primarily and matrimonial conflict, I would say, domestic violence, issues of uh, divorce, child custody, uh, maintenance, etc., in the family court as well as in the uh, magistrate court. Remember, and sporadically we used to offer support to rape victims uh, if some NGO referred to us saying that this woman or this child needs help to be in court and what are the legal issues that might come up. But in this particular case, a child was abused in a school next to our office. It's in the vicinity of our office, like five minutes away. And uh, it, it was reported in newspapers. And very adverse kind of uh, sort of a media campaign was happening that um, this woman, the builders have given her money. She's demanding 10 lakhs from the school. Uh, she's insane. Uh, she's made up this whole story. Uh, she's estranged from her husband. Uh, and uh, the school authorities will only talk to her husband, etc., etc. And we're reading this report and we said this ne woman needs help. You know, she cannot handle this entire criminal legal system on her own. And she will be very badly uh, singed by the system. If she goes through it, she doesn't know what she's in for. So we looked around in the city and we said, is there anybody who provides this kind of support? Because we're not criminal lawyers. We don't give this kind of criminal support, uh, criminal legal support. Though sporadically we have done. Uh, so we said, let's see, we can, because we can't take on everything on our own. We looked around. And unfortunately, despite all our talk and engagement with the issue, we realized there's no one who's taking this up. And we didn't want to put this woman and child onto anybody who would not pay serious attention to it. So I posed this challenge to my team and I said, let's do it. But my team uh, members, very young lawyers, and they said, no, ma'am, we don't understand criminal law. We don't understand this. We don't understand that. I said, never mind. We will learn. And anyway, we are not defense lawyers. Any lawyer, criminal law, uh, lawyer who is well versed with criminal law will be a defense lawyer. He will only understand the issue from the perspective of uh, the accused person. And we don't want that kind of person. And we know how the public prosecutors, how they work, wh what are their difficulties, what are their challenges. So we don't want to, like, we will be working with public prosecutors, but we are not that. How do we put the victim perspective into the domain, into this field, that this is what the woman wants, this is what the child wants. So I said, we are unique, and we have to take on this space. And we'll start. Maybe we'll make mistakes. Maybe we'll flounder around as you go along. 
but we will learn in this process. So I urged my team, I said, we have to take up this challenge. And while doing so, it took two years. And on the other side, for the school watchman was the entire school board. Because there was a teacher who was implicated, there was a maid, uh, the helper who was uh, implicated, and there was a watchman. And the entire education, Kalina Education Society board rallied around these people, and they would come to court on every date. And they engaged the services of a very high profile uh, criminal lawyer, Majid Memon. So here was a very young lawyer who was not yet a lawyer when she started, she was just a student who was going along with this case, coming back, giving us information, then we would guide her and go to the next stage, etc. And, and on the other side was the criminal, uh, Majid Maman. Bail applications, various things, meeting the uh, police, what we can change in the FIR now, what we cannot change in the FIR, what needed to have been done, what could, was not done, etc. This case, only good thing that the police did was because they had messed up the case in the beginning. Um, they had uh, put the Atrocities Act into it because the woman and the child were Dalits. And because of it, the inquiry went to the ACP. And because of it, she got some compensation. The child was given 25000 at the initial stage. Because of the ACP level investigation uh, and the ACP realized that what had happened at the ground level, etc., uh, the case a little bit came on track, but not, not really. What damage has been done at the initial stage cannot be undone later at all. And the lawyer and the PP and the judge who were here in the case had no idea about sexual abuse at all because they were the special court for atrocity act. And he's a special PP for the Atrocity Act. So they may, ha may or may not know atrocity, which I do not know, uh, but they did not know sexual abuse at all. And uh, all, both of them were very negative. They had not heard of any like Sakshi guidelines, anything at all. And the PP thought we were talking in French. He said, oh, all this doesn't happen here. It happens in the Supreme Court. You, if the Supreme Court uh, ruling is there, you tell the Supreme Court. It doesn't happen in the trial courts. And we said, no, no, it happens. You know, if Supreme Court says, we have to all abide by it. He says, no, 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 nothing like that. Judge will say, where is that? What do you mean? So, slowly we went around. And this case was her shifted because nobody knew whether it should go to a special court for women, special court for children, or special court for atrocity. So it went on shifting from one court to the other, etc. But we stood very firmly that the accused person will not be released on bail. Finally, after much... Uh, and what all had gone wrong? When the woman went the first day from the school, when she realized the child was in pain and there was damage to her hymen and she, there was redness around the area, she rushed to the police station. The police station uh, called the principal of the school and the principal of the school shouted at this woman and they said, why you come to come uh, file a complaint? If you file the complaint, I will dismiss your child from school. And imagine for an illiterate migrant family, uh, this is uh, like English medium education, KG class, etc. If the child is thrown out, where will she, what will she do? And it has seemed such a huge kind of threat for her if the child is dismissed from the school. Next day, the child, uh, the uh, investigating officer, a lady, told the child that, okay, mother and child come to school, I will see the scene of the crime. Next day, the child was taken up alone. The mother was not allowed to be with her. The principal and the teachers, all of them got together and bombarded the child and said, where did it happen? How did it happen? The four-year-old couldn't speak. The police said the report uh, that the child cannot speak. child didn't speak. So there's no case. On the third day, the woman took the child to a private doctor because the child was still in pain. The uh, private doctor examined the child and sent her, this, this is a criminal case. It has to be referred to the sign hospital. So the mother went and child went to the sign hospital. At the sign hospital at the OPD entry point, uh, they wrote there is no vaginal injury. Later, the child was examined in the gynec ward and then that doctor realized, a lady doctor over there uh, said there is injury. So in the, uh, during the argument, they made it out like from the OPD to the uh, gynec department, the woman has injured the child. Okay, there is no injury at the beginning, but there was injury later. How can that happen? In the hospital, she's taken the child to the toilet and injured the child and then taken to the gynec ward. 
can you imagine how absurd the arguments can be so uh, then um, they, that doctor saw the child called the wakala police station and said this is a case of um, rape so record the statement the st statement was recorded at 1 pm at night of a 4 year old child who is in the hospital in the morning at 10 o'clock whole day they have gone through this torture sent back here at 1 o'clock the, uh, the statement gets recorded now what the child says and that's the most interesting part the statement is recorded every time the mother is asked also she tell child has said the same thing mother has said child has said police have said we have said everybody has said budda uncle ne kira dala so it is recorded budda uncle ne kira dala nobody says what is kira where did the kira come from but what we have in a support is a medical evidence saying that the child, the vaginal area is injured it's redness in the area even after 3 days so there's something has happened to the child in the cross examination it comes that what is the skeda so the defense lawyer shows the children's chart of various like you know animals insects skeda so he says is this skeda the child says yeah this is skeda so that's only the question so what was inserted was never actually clear at all and how the statements are recorded through this but because of that it became clear that something was inserted it was not clear it was um, pino uh, uh, penis penetration so finally we got uh, 377 um, a conviction for 7 years it ought to have been at least 10 years but because of this discrepancy what is kira and the mother was asked what is kira the police was asked what is kira the child was asked what is kira and nobody could say and this question had never been asked and then we could not what the word is called tutor the child to see something more that is than what is written in the fir we could not put words in the mouth of the child to see if kira means this or that we wanted to keep it at the level of the child because many times those who work in support put or sometimes the police who are over eager over over enthusiastic put words in the mouth of the child which a child could never have uttered or even an ngo working with a child uh, makes the child do the actions which a child would never know that this is what happened and explain very uh, graphically so how to have that restraint that how much support you give the child and how much restraint you have that you are not putting your own words the police is not putting their own words it remains within the words of the child but it remains within the sphere of the law and where the child can speak because ultimately it will be the child that will have to speak for us it was a major success that we it was not the kind of cases that we will nikam wins where the other side where there no lawyer but the name at all it's a, uh, whether it's the spanish rape case shakti mills case those boys did not have competent legal advice and um he gets a huge amount per day for uh, doing these cases and here there was absolutely the pp did not have a clue pp given given up the case he said so much discrepancy madam why you are taking so much trouble there is no need this case no it's gone case no need to give a written arguments no need to give a oral arguments no need to pro provide case law no madam is case mein koi dam nahi aap isme time miss mat karo dusra case lo so a case that everybody had given up we could actually win it though we told ourselves win or lose is not important to make this child comfortable while the child is going through this process is the most important thing i kept on telling our um, team of young lawyers don't be upset don't be disheartened this is not the end of the story we have learned so much in the process and that learning is most important for us outcome is not in our hands mistakes have happened but we know what needs to be done and i think it was a great learning experience in the, in the middle we also uh, had two or three other cases that were referred to us by other ngos and all of them ended in conviction what does it mean if all these cases in the conviction rate which according to me in bombay is less than 10% that till then we got 10% success so it it points out to an particular issue that i think vidya was trying to raise in her, the earlier session that what we need to do here i want to flag two issues three issues from the earlier discussion 
One is, okay, we got POXO. We worked very hard to get POXO. Many groups campaigned. And POXO is here. Many of us have been working on this issue before. And many of us continue to work on this issue now. What has changed for us? Because we wanted POXO, we got in POXO, POXO is out there. What has changed for us in the pattern that we work because POXO is there? Does it bring any change because there is a law which says particular things and how our own work must shift if there is a law that says something which law we wanted, we brought about and today that law is there. How do we work with that law? If we are working in the same area, doing the same kind of work, then we are now aided by a law. How does it impact our work? How do we go forward with that work? According to me, this is my first question. The second one, the criminal law, IPC, 376, etc. And this is something I had written way back in 1990. And actually, the women's movement has always taken up sexual violence issues, not really addressed them as child issues. Like, for instance, Mathura was 16 year old. And uh, whether she was 15 or 16, that was the contested issue. And way back in 1980, when the women's movement started, this rape law needs to be changed, uh, custodial protection for the uh, a woman, for the child in custody, you can't take the woman or a child in the police station, etc., all these issues. We never articulated them as issues concerning child sexual abuse. They were issues of sexual violation by state authorities. Only after POXO came, then do you work with children? Do you work with women? What exactly do you do? Are you a child rights person? Are you this? Are you that? I said, I am a person who's worked against sexual violence for the last 30 years. So does that qualify me as a person working on child rights or sexual violence against women? What is the segregation? If the girl is 18 or if the girl is 17, what's the major change that happens in the court or within the system? So. For me, it has been a continuum, pre-POXO, post-POXO, pre-criminal law amendment, post-criminal law amendment, pre-amendment of 1983, uh, uh, post-Mathura. For me, there's been a continuous work, but um, I, I had, though I've written a lot on this issue of sexual violence, I've never really worked on victim support till this case on a day-to-day -day basis. I understand the criminal law very well. I know the case law, what the Supreme Court has said, what the high courts have said, etc have brought a lot of publications on this, but actual ground level victim support, this is our first time. And our work, as I said, started in 2011, and then we were aided by POXO in 2012, and then criminal law amendment 2013. So how does it impact our work? The second issue that I want to flag is that if you see this entire criminal legal system, until now, it only looks at the, the state is there and the accused is there. And the abused person, the violated person, is a witness for the state. And the state will use the person as and how the state wants the person to be used in order to get conviction, because for the state, the conviction is the most important aspect. But as a support person, what is the most important aspect for us has never been articulated, it's never been put down there. And we gloat over every time there's a conviction, death penalty, whatever. But we're not concerned whether even in death penalty, whether the victim support was there or not there. Or whether it is a flagship case for the state, or are there something more that's happening, even in the case that is very high profile. And this is something we really need to understand, we really need to concentrate on. Where is this victim? And who is the state agency? Who will provide that kind of support? We know that NGOs are doing various kind of work, prevention, awareness, support, whatever. But where is that state agency who must come into the picture of the criminal law system to provide this kind of support? Because the Home Department is not concerned at all. The judiciary is not concerned at all. Why? Because the judiciary is concerned with the system, the fairness of the system, so that both parties are not treated unequally, etc., etc. And they say conviction and acquittal is not my problem, not our problem. Home Department is concerned with conviction. Their concern is detection of the crime, investigation, 
and prosecution and conviction. They go on that trajectory. Who gets le left behind, behind is the child or the woman who has been sexually abused. And whether there is conviction or whether there is acquittal, that is not important for her. Her notion of justice, her notion of redressal does not actually lie in the fact whether somebody got a death penalty or 10 years or 7 years or 3 years. That is not the issue. The issue is that how this child has been, since the uh, crime has been detected, how is this child accidentally many times, many, many times accidentally, she has turned into a victim of sexual violence, though she herself had not realized this. And she's put into this system. What is there for her in this system? And I think that's the most important part. Why we are all here. We are all here not to increase conviction rates. Let's be very clear. We are here that in a society, sexual abuse should not happen. We are here that if sexual abuse does happen, how do we take care of that child or that woman who has got into that system? And how do we protect her from the accused person, but also from the system per se? Because system is so harsh. System is so, um, uh, so intimidating everywhere, right from the entry point at the police station, as in a four-year-old child, to the hospital, to the CWC, to the shelter home, to the court, to the public prosecutor, to the judge. Continuum of hostility that this child faces. But the worst is what Madhavi raised at point, the child had forgotten. Okay, it's normal, the child forgot. Child wanted to forget, maybe. And what is our role as legal support person? We have to ensure that the child will never forget. What did we do with the child? Every time the child came to our office, very casually, I said jokingly, ki kya hua tha? Yaad hai na, abhi bhi. Uncle hai na. Ha ha, uncle. Because she, we cannot afford the child to forget. Exactly what the counselor's role is to get over, forget. If you are in the legal system, you have to, till the case comes, the child must remember and say what she said in the FIR. That is the most important part. So there's a conflict here between counseling and a legal support. But here, when Madhavi said the child forgot, or I will give you tens and tens and hundreds of judgments, the minute the guy gets acquitted, that means she is becomes a criminal. <coughs> Why should there be a uh, conviction? Because at least some semblance of justice is there that she told the truth. That's all she gets from the system. She gets sort of a vindication. Because if this doesn't happen, that supposing she's pregnant. And the dates don't match. I'm just re I was reading a judgment when I was coming here. The date didn't match. The child, a 13-year-old child who is six months pregnant, had broken her limb, fallen from a staircase. Her mother is child when she's young. Father is a, a drug addict. Uh, the grandmother. And there is this child. The child slipped from her attic down. Uh, she broke her hand. So she was taken to the hospital. There she was detected that she was like six months pregnant. Then she recalls a day that this happened on that particular day. And now this child is put in the witness box. And then she says, did, did this happen? Did this happen? Then what? Then she, this child has had consensual sex, which under POXO is still an offense. Yet you say that this woman, child is a bad girl. She's of a bad character. She had a boyfriend and she conceived through that. And, and, and this accused person, she has deliberately framed, or her family is framed, which she had no intention of framing anybody at all. She's just going about a lie. Uh, like, did she tell lies? Did she knew she was pregnant? Uh, did she, did she, was she raped when she was pregnant because the dates don't match? Because by this time she was already pregnant and the dates, and 13-year-old child. You ask many of us, what is your last menstrual date you won't be able to tell to educated women like us? You expect this, and this child has to meet this kind of expectations from the system in order to forget the conviction to that person or not. What does this child get at the end of the story? And most of these girls who are abused comes from this most vulnerable families. Most of them, the mother is not there. Mother has died or mother has left, etc. Father is a drug addict. And this child is into the system accidentally. So what becomes our role then? What do we do? And I think that is a question needs answering. 
how does the entire system which is created in her name, which is created for her, at least an epoxoid is created for her. Police must do this, CWC must do this, shelter home must do this. What do they actually do for this child when she comes there? And what do we do? Because we say all this, all this, Poxo is there, he is there, all the time we talk about this, 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 all, everything is there. What do we do? We are sensitive people, we are qualified people, we are engaged with this issue. What exactly do we do? What do we want to do? And how do we want to help this child? So we had a meeting in September 2012 and we got all stakeholders together because there is a blame game. Prosecution says that judge is insensitive. That's why this judge doesn't give conviction. Or they say police do not uh, do investigation, what can we do? Police say we do the investigation, this PP doesn't read the papers, doesn't argue the case, half the time is not in the court. Judge says the PP has not prepared anything, the police have not done their work, so we cannot give conviction. So the entire system is into this entrapment where they all the time blame the other. And we've gone through those kind of meetings. So we say you all sit together, talk to each other. No, they never talk to each other. One thing we realized is they never talk to each other. What does the police have to say to the prosecution? What does the prosecution has to say for the medical? What do the uh, medical has to say regarding the police? Why do they do certain things? Why didn't they do something else, etc.? So we had this interaction, which is very revealing because that is the first time they talk to each other. And they said, okay, you must do this, you must do this, you must do this. And all the time, we're not getting enough money, PPs are not paid, so and so doesn't happen. But in that entire discourse, the victim was not there at all. There is this child, you are here because to discuss the problems of this child. How do you treat this child? That never came up for discussion until we intervened and we said, okay, let us now put the child here into the room and say, look at the child and say what you need to do from the perspective of the child, because the child can't speak and there's nobody in the system who speaks for her. And according to me, if there is one role we as NGOs must do is to be the voice of the child. And how best do we do that into the justice system? Then what happened, the new entry into it was the Women and Child Development Department. And we worked along with them and we created this entire system that WCD, Women and Child Development, and we convinced them this is your responsibility. Child and women is your responsibility. Conviction is not your responsibility. Judgment giving is not your responsibility. Medical whatever is not your responsibility. Throughout looking at the child and supporting the child or the woman, because both women and child is under your care. So you have to take this initiative. And the slogan must change from uh, detection, conviction, uh, um, uh, investigation, conviction, etc. to say care, support and protection. That should be the WCD um, slogan for this conference and thereafter that we need to do a shift into this justice delivery system because the POXO mandates it. The law mandates it that everybody has to work in a different manner, keeping the child in the context. So how do we do this? Which ministry that we work with? Uh, and through this ministry, how do we get a convergence? How do we get a convergence through all of them so that all of them change their perspective and work from, from a point of view of supporting the child within the legal system. As a lawyer, I do not do prevention work. I do only support in the legal framework. And, uh, and very few people actually are engaged with this legal system and not as a criminal lawyer, not as a public prosecutor, not as a judge, but as a legal person of a support nature. And from there you see the system for the child and examine the roles of each other. So this is what our program, support program, survivor support program, which we have called Rahat in the collaboration with the government is. So um, I'll wind up now and I will open it up for discussion. So you can ask me any questions uh, regarding my presentation. Thank you. Uh, my name is Parul and I'm from Shaishav, Gujarat. Uh, I have uh, this question to you. Uh, is it that the child sex abuse are increasing day by day 
And uh, in compared to the uh, violence against women and uh, the child sex abuse, is there a, is is, uh, is the ratio increasing? I really need to understand this. And if it is so, why? Can I'll take two or three questions and answer. Uh, it's Ingrid from Childline, Flavia. Uh, the question is, one of the problems we are facing with reporting is because of the increased penalties and the increased uh, probability of conviction under POXO. But first of all, the good news. We're seeing a doubling of reporting as a result of POXO. I mean, if you just look at pre-POXO, post-POXO reporting rates, reporting rates have doubled. But the downside of it is that abuse that's happening within families or among, from whether the, the um, perpetrator is a known entity, which is of course 90 odd percent of cases, uh, there's much greater reluctance to take it, to make it official because of the anticipation of a greater likelihood of penalties and more severe penalties. Is that, how do we find that balance in a sense between the benefits of POXO and the limitations or the constraints it's imposing? One more question, can somebody here? So we can make best use of the time, yeah. Hi, I'm Amit Sen. I'm a child psychiatrist from Delhi. Uh, my question to you is that since you have had some success by bringing these various stakeholders in a joint meeting where people are not passing the buck from each other and blaming each other, is there a scope of actually building such system like child protection teams? And has your organization tried to do that? Yeah, okay. Um, to answer your first question, domestic violence and child sexual abuse, as Ingrid has just said, much of the child sexual abuse also happens in the home. So I don't see there's a d discontinuity between the two. And when child sexual abuse happens at home, it is domestic violence too. But we have not had a legal framework in to which to have the criminal law of child sexual abuse and the protection of the Domestic Violence Act read together. We've been telling our uh, uh, PPs and our police to do it, that you see it is a continuum of domestic violence, so put read with, like domestic violence you can read with other things. So read, read every time there's a father abusing, grandfather abusing, family member abusing, etc. Read it together, so at least you have certain protection to the child while the criminal law is going on. Even if the child doesn't want to be institutionalized, you can still protect the child in many ways. We can have more discussion on that. Now, reporting, as Ingrid has said, has increased. Whether incidents increased, uh, one cannot tell. Maybe all this was happening all this time, but nobody was coming forward to report. And when they did come forward, the police were not recording. And that's also our reality, because nobody wanted their police station to have high rate of uh, uh, child sexual abuse or uh, any of these crimes because it's a law and order question and it's not a child protection issue. But suddenly after uh, the whole uh, Delhi gang rape issue, etc, etc, the lid broke out, was taken off and in fact it's just coming out. And people are expecting a lot from the system when they come and report. And then they feel very badly let down by the system because there's nothing else there except the reporting. Um, in some cases, conv conviction rates may have gone up, but it, the child has no protection as of now, though the POXO ensures that kind of protection. So I, I do not say, I, do, I don't know, anyone can say whether incidents have gone up, but you can definitely say reporting has gone up. As compared to domestic violence and uh, child sexual abuse, uh, according to me, every time there's a domestic violence in the home, the child becomes much more vulnerable to even sexual abuse. Uh, but I don't want to touch upon that. But I want to say both domestic violence and child sexual abuse are in the increase. And particularly after the PWDBA Act came into place, etc. And uh, people are expecting far more support systems. What is lacking is not the law. What is lacking is the support system. And that's where we need to work. Um, yeah, actually your uh, question then flows directly into Ingrid's question. I am uh, whether uh, today there is this uh, today means I would say after the Shakti Mills death penalty there will be far more reluctance 
to put the blame on a 14 year old child for the life of a father because the father is first raped one sister and then he's raped another sister second sister went and complained uh, subsequently she has also told the police that my sister was also abused so you bring these two sisters and the mother is petrified that father will be given death penalty imagine the pressure on the child so what are we achieving through this are we saying if it's a family member no death penalty if it is urchin boy only then death penalty if it is a per person from a social class then it's okay if it is a little bit here and there, you know, boys do, men do, bosses do, everybody does, judges do, everybody does. You know, some chance poor guys, you know, they, they're like that only. So, are we saying that? But these boys, you know, uh, urchin boys, they need to be hanged because we don't want urchins anyway. So, whether for rape or anything, we can hang them very conveniently. So, having a standard of justice, which is class-based, which is really worrying. Even when I do uh, women's rights, child rights, issues of sexual abuse, the class bias of the entire system is really, really worrying us. And this also brings us, because most of the children who are violated are coming from our slums. They're very vulnerable sections of the children. And if this is what is looming large in front of them, they will not come and report, which is no, no issue. There's not possibility. The second issue, and this is what uh, a question, I'll come back to your question, but what has not been raised so far in this meeting, but we need to flag it here. By a stroke of pen, we increase the age of consent from 16 to 18. And we brought under it all kinds of sexual activity, including the consensual sexual activity. And we said no child, girl or boy, must touch anybody. The way to touch it is crime. Hands, apart from like face and hands and whatever, no other body part must be touched. No kissing, no holding hand, no nothing, nothing at all. But the boys are not aware. There's no simultaneous educational program in our schools, in our colleges. Don't touch girls, otherwise you'll get seven years. I'm getting cases, I'm reading cases where somebody's held somebody's hand for, a, for hand and somebody else saw it and reported and the boys inside for a year or three years. Because we want the poxer to act well, judges think, yes, it must be acted well. So what is the system we are getting into is very scary. And that is something we really need to do. But what mostly happens is the parental power of a girl whom they know is having an affair with a boy who is not of their choice. And then they go and complain. But I dealt with a case where the girl and the boy, both families wanted to marry also. Everything was, uh, uh, everything was settled, but the girl was only 14. She was eight months pregnant. She goes to the public hospital. Immediately, the doctors report. The boy is arrested. The boy is put inside. And the woman says, all she wants is to meet this boy. Because she's eight months pregnant, about to deliver, and she wants to at least see this boy. The boy was inside for one and a half years. And then... Why the victim will not turn hostile, you tell me. Because ultimately she has to identify the boy, she has to say he raped me. Your entire system you might put on a moral ground. And you may use the entire state infrastructure. Put the boy in uh, jail, this thing, that thing, criminal trial, no bail, whatever, go through this entire system. Last, either the victim turns hostile and say he didn't rape me. Or she'll say, uh, I don't know this boy. What will you do about that? Because she's in love with this boy. She wants the boy to come out and marry him. Excuse me, what can you do with from your moral grounds? What is the answer you can give for this? And of course, it may come in medical. The, another issue is that girl has had sex consensually. She's pregnant. She's gone to a public hospital. And she wants to have an MTP. MTP law says confidentiality is ensured. POXA says compulsory and mandatory reporting. Doctors are asking us, but madam, what are we supposed to do? Follow this law or follow that law? I'm just flagging this issue for your discussion. Maybe tomorrow it will come up. Very, very uh, strongly it will come up. And uh, we need to address this. I am uh, I'm afraid that the standard that we apply, from our perspective, when we do that, a lot of people fall through the net. And we really don't care because our moral standards are maintained. And because we have the power, we have the power of uh, influencing the system, negotiating with the system, etc. And we're not careful that how differently situated people uh, will be affected by this law. And I think we need to have 
a much more inclusive kind of system and understanding while we are campaigning for law because each of us have different perspective and they have to meet and they have to be come together from the perspective of the victim and that should be our uh, our yardstick our touchstone and not our moral positioning and i think that's very important yes what you're saying is absolutely right we did many many things here this is only one issue that i flagged here we also in our state got in uh, our, a compensation scheme called manodarya scheme through which after the fir is filed the fir will be submitted to the wcd department and under the collector a committee is formed which has public prosecutor medical officer etc etc and based on that fir the child will be our victim will be given compensation uh, 2 lakhs in rape cases and 3 lakhs in aggravated rape cases and acid attack cases so we have that system now along with that we also have uh, trying to put in a system called district trauma team or other manodariya support system that just giving money is not enough that we need to have a system what we are trying to do is do a pilot in bombay and maybe in few districts we work very closely with childland foundation in our victim support program and we want to formalize it more and have this thing what is the first step of the support that is required Uh, because now we have worked for 3 years and we understand what is sub- needed at the first entry point when you first go and meet the uh, child the survivor the victim how so you want to address it who are the different uh, departments that come into play what should be their role what is the expertise they need and then we know exactly this is the first entry point a second entry point is at the trial stage so what is the continuum of support and who will provide that support because there is nobody in the system today to provide that support so can we train can we train people within the government machinery like of course ngos are there all of us are working but it's not even a drop in the system a drop in the ocean unless the system incorporates it and then only it can be a state program or a national program i'm just telling indeed our organization thinks very small if you do some work good work in bombay we're very very happy few women we reach out and we think that we have changed the entire world or whatever but that should not be we have to create what uh, in this said we amplify we not the innovators but we are amplifiers and we would like to work along with them so that whatever little thing that we very laboriously and very uh, minutely work out with the technical legal system can be amplified into a state project into a national project i think we would have reached somewhere thank you